this video we are going to tell you about the difference between the current mainstream in economics, which is the neoclassical theory, and the feminist economic theory. The feminist view in economics has less to do with a political agenda but rather with a contribution to enrich how economists should move away from a gender-biased theoretical framework like the neoclassical models. So what do we mean by that? We mean that current mainstream economic theory has an inclination towards models that don't take into account the complexity of reality but perhaps for simplicity decided to standardize all the people involved in economic activity into a single mold. Many researchers, as Nancy Folber and Julie Nelson, have dedicated much of their work to demonstrate how this male-driven perspective of economics is not really modeling reality, but only giving us half of the perspective. Think of feminist economics as the other half that is missing in the economics theory. It does not aim to take over and throw away all the models and replace them, rather think of it as completing the whole picture. Feminist economics are not only an abstract theoretical framework, their critiques and contributions can be seen in many branches of economics. An example of those branches, household economics, labor economics, development economics, have been to topics where feminists have already contributed in a lot in showing an alternative perspective to the neoclassical view. In household economics, critiques are aimed at the egocentric agent that at the same time has also an altruistic character. This means that it is thought that agents are egocentric outside the household or at work, for example. However, when interacting with family member, the agent is a completely different one, who is not selfish and distributes his income among all members. In labor economics, many critiques point Points are directed towards discrimination of women due to the fact that women are employed in more labor-intensive sectors like the care sector. As we will see further in the video, this segregation of jobs has a lot to do with social assumptions associated with motherhood, etc., which is Im impregnated in society, making it hard to shift from it when institutions and preferences are thought to be exogenous from the model as in neoclassical economics. With regards to the development economics, a broader perspective of how the economy works can help better understand how to promote economic development. In a study by Ongaro in 1988 in Kenya on the adoption of new farming technology in maize production and impact of gender relations by comparing the effect on yields of weeding, it was shown that women have more inclination to save than their male counterparts, even more so when women were the breadwinners and single. If, the, if women were the breadwinners, but there was a male counterparty because of his belief of entitlement, the household saved less money. These are clear examples of how agents behave differently in reality and standardizing their activities does not present the whole picture. But to see and learn more about it, stay with us for a couple of more minutes. Neoclassic theory first rose to prominence in the 1970s and superseded the Keynesianism as the current mainstream theory. The core of the neoclassical theory is the illustration of a market system in which supply and demand for a good is arranged by a price mechanism. This is supported by very narrow assumptions about the human beha behavior, the so-called homo economicus. The homo economicus only behavioral assumptions are that he maximizes its utility. He has stable preference and is fully informed about prices. Furthermore, there exists stable market equilibria. As you can see, these do not really correspond with reality and abstracts all social and psychological factors of human behavior. The theory of the firm. In the neoclassical theory, firms are not needed to explain market actions. Production is only visible through a production function, the most famous one being the Cobb Douglas. An example for a feminist approach to this matter could be the work of Edith Penrose, even though she might not have called her fe a feminist economist. Penrose argues that a firm consists of productive services directed by its managers. Not the resources are important for a firm, but the services connected to these resources. In her theory, there can be no equilibria because a firm always has unused resources. As already told, the neoclassical theory implies that in the long run, all markets are in equilibrium. Gary Becker, a neoclassical economist, observed in the economics of discrimination from 1957 the wage gap. He means that a wage gap between women and men is a temporary failure which will decline because targeting a market equilibrium where discrimination is inefficient. However, discrimination seems to persist in the long run. Barbara R. Berkman observed in 1973 
to, uh, she tried to explain the persistence of discrimination with occupational segregation. She meant that the too high labor supply in some feminine sectors is causing lower payments. Edmund Phelps introduced the assumption of uncertainty, also called statistic discrimination. The companies cannot know for sure which applicant would perform better or would be more stable. If they think men are in average more productive, they will discriminate women. A further model which critiques the previous models is the human capital model from Polacek, where he tries to imply that women are investing less in their human capital because of breaks. The result is the wage gap. But how does the feminine economics react to these models? Even if there is a lot of critique, they don't reject all of the neoclassical attempts. From the feminist economic perspective, none of the neoclassical models alone can subscribe the effects of occupational segregation or can explain the many different kinds of discrimination. One critique point is the homo economicus and the utility function. As Julie Nelson wrote in 1995, not every action is rational, people could act altruistic. So the feminist economics is not only trying to show that there is discrimination, it tries to take care of sociological perspective, for example, why is there a labor market segregation or why and how are sex roles influencing the economic outcome. Introduce forms of economic thinking that break the mold of mainstream economics, it is necessary to challenge neoclassical theory in their fundamental assumptions, as these are the base that pave the way for its highly formalized and mathematical models. The formalization is one reason why it is quite difficult for heterodox and therefore also feminist approaches to be seen as scientifically correct and thus worth to be published and discussed. A field that can be worked on is the concept of the homo economicus, more precisely the so-called rationality hypothesis that leads to the utility maximization we heard of earlier. In his 2005 paper, Austrian economist Kurt Rothschild states that we must first stress that the opposition to the rationality hypothesis does not amount to the proposal for an irrationality hypothesis. Rather, it is a criticism of the narrow definition of rationality in neoclassical theory. Criticizing this hypothesis means, in general, that individuals indeed make rational decisions. But what is rational, it depends on the concrete situation. Also, a decision that is rational for any individual does not have to be utility maximizing under all circumstances. Additionally, to be fully rational in theory, a decision makes maker must have access to all relevant information, a case that is not very likely in reality. Julie Nelson concludes in her 2001 working paper version later published as Confronting the Science Value Split, the feminist process view presented here sees the world, including the economic world, as unfinished and evolving, and sees knowledge as adding to that world, for better or for worse. Science is thus intrinsically a matter of value. Yet, one can expect considerable resistance to such a view from those to whom a belief in a static, cold, and hierarchical universe is emotionally crucial. Those who cannot tolerate the notion of flux, who seek control and mastery instead of creativity and proper management. A main reason neoclassical models seem to be quite attractive is the fact that their formal and mathematical attempt leads to exact and unique solutions when dealing with the describing economic processes. This also leads to the resistance against other forms of thinking mentioned by Nelson and also by Rothschild, as any concepts departing too far from the given ways are viewed as a potential threat that may collapse the whole thing of neoclassical theory.